So this morning, we have moved from the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and we're going into John now. Uh, we're only going to cover this t- this morning, um, and it will be short because it, it's, there's a lot to John. However, there is a handout that can help you not only this morning follow along, but also do a study on your own after the lesson to get further uh, uh, familiar with these texts to, and to study this this theology for your understanding of God's glory. So please go on to the Sunday School lesson channel to get the lesson that I have submitted this morning. And I'll read the, the introductory quotation and begin from there. And truly, Jesus did many, many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that believing you may have life in his name. John 20, 30 through 31. That's an appropriate way to introduce John. He spends much time uh, revealing the glory of God through various signs. And there is a whole point about that, the second uh, Roman numeral. So just to remind everybody that we just covered the synoptics and we sought to look in the synoptics to see the glory of God in Christ Jesus, particularly in his birth, his incarnation, his transfiguration, and his second coming. And the track we're kind of running on to go to these events, go to these things in these scriptures is the word doxa. We're kind of using that as our track to run on to help us navigate through these gospels. And as another reminder that using that word is helpful, but it is limited and it's not exhaustive. So please don't feel like you've got an, an introduction or a survey of the entire synoptics or the entire John after this morning. But just remember that all we've looked at is the word doxa in various key places in the Gospels so that you could uh, challenge yourself with looking into it further and not... Um, being content with what you have. So, for John, since we've already covered the incarnation, we've already covered the transfiguration and the second coming, and we've already gone through doxa some, even though I'm still going to use that, that term, and because John uses it more than the other three combined, um, we're not going to look at those events. We're going to focus on these three bullets this morning, primarily the last one. And the first Roman numeral is God's glory revealed in the only begotten Son. And Roman numeral two, God's glory revealed in signs. And Roman numeral three, God's glory revealed in the cross and resurrection. So for the first point since uh, we aren't going to spend a lot of time on these first two in order to get to the last point, I would like to kind of look at these texts and if you've heard it before, remind you or instruct you again or instruct you for the first time uh, some fundamental truths with who Christ is and Him being uh, the way in which we can learn of God and His glory. And it starts off with the eternal Son of God. So John really hits on this when he uses the word doxa. He wants to make sure uh, that his readers know that Jesus is not a man merely. He's not a prophet merely. He is God, a very God. He is the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God come from heaven in the flesh, uh, incarnated. So he starts right off. Let's look at John chapter 1. Verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And if you remember the word, John has already used it in verses one through three, which was one of our memory verses from last lessons. And I want to read that. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. This is very clear here in First John, or John chapter 1, verse 1, that the word is not to be personally identified with God, but is with God and has no beginning. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God. It doesn't mean there that he is with God, the word is with God, and then changes and now is that God. It's saying there that the word was divine, deity. The word was all that God is as divine and uniquely God, holy, set apart, and only God, Jesus, the word is. He was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him. And then back to verse 14. And the word became flesh. This is the incarnation which we discussed uh, two weeks ago. And dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. So they, they, the glory that they're beholding of the word is coming through his life as a man. John is reflecting back on walking and handling Christ. And he's thinking of the words and works of Christ and all the prophecies fulfilled. And he's growing and he's uh, constantly growing just like any other believer. And at the time he writes, being carried along by the Holy Spirit, he, he says, we beheld his glory. And he's just thinking about the life of Jesus Christ. He knew that this is not a, merely a man. This is that the second person of the Trinity. This is God from heaven. When I looked into his eyes and when I touched his hands, I was talking to my creator. And he's writing that to remind of right off the bat when he gets into his book. That's who this is that I'm writing to you about. And the purpose that he has for writing all this about Jesus, he puts in John chapter 20, it's that you might believe and have life in his name. Um, and there is much packed in there in that word glory because it's not dealing merely with the transfiguration when he saw a radiant glory shone around them and Christ transfigured before them. It's not limited to that. He's talking about Christ dwelling among them. So it's uh, his words, his acts, his everything that came from him as a form of communication to John. John said that was a revelation of the glory of God. And it says the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So that's the point there is God's glory is revealed in the only begotten Son. So God the Father sent God the Son to become man and fulfill the covenant of redemption to save a people. And <clears throat> this only begotten of the Father is not referencing Jesus's incarnation or his humanity. It's referencing his eternal sonship. Um, there's some people who have trouble uh, receiving this monogenes and interpreting it only begotten because in their mind they can't 
remove themselves from thinking about begotten being birthed or from a father. And they want to say only begotten is unique or just uh, the only, like only or unique. But it is begotten. The word is clearly begotten. And if you go to John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For God did not send his son, I'm reading from verse 17, into the world to condemn, but that the world through him might be saved. God the Father sent his son. That means prior to his humanity, prior to his incarnation, he was the son. That's speaking of his eternal sonship. And I wanted to give you a a brief reminder of that definition before we move on. Eternal generation, which it's related to eternal sonship. It's the establishment from all eternity of the filial relationship of the second person in the Trinity, in the Trinity. Here's a more technical term for those who are more familiar with this inter-Trinitarian theology. Another way of stating this is the eternal mode of filiation of the second person in the Trinity. It describes his relational order of his personal subsistence to the Father. So when we say the word subsistence, we're talking about not the substance, the divine essence. We're talking about that mode or form of substance or the way in which he uh, exists. And the way in which the, su- the second person of the Trinity exists or in, uh, uh subsists is in a relational order to the personal subsistence of the father and that relational order is one of sonship it's not stating that Jesus is not co-eternal all powerful Uh, he is God of very God and is uh I, I would like to find where it, uh, yes they are co-eternal co-substantial and equal in power and glory um, we can what we can state emphatically is that in contrast to the human father son relationship there is no derivation of being or existence of subordination or posterity in time. So it, that, that's a, a difficult thing, but what we're trying to, Calvin had a, labored hard with this to a rid uh, theology from some poor error from church, some church fathers. And what, what he wanted to be careful was to maintain was the divinity of Christ, but also this distinct sonship of Christ. And that's where you get the statement Jesus is co-eternal and he um, uh, what I I just read derivation of being uh, if, if he got his divine essence from the father then he would not be very God of very God what he gets from the father is is related to his personal subsistence All right, well, let's, let's move on. Um, Calvin said each person is autotheos, they're self-existent. And both, are God is, is, when we think about the being of God, he is unbegotten, and that's the being. But then when we think about the personal relationships of the Trinity, the Father is unbegotten, but the Son is begotten of the Father. There's a difference there between the Father and the Son. And that's when the Bible uses the term only begotten. Okay, well, let, let's move on. And if you want to get into that with more thought, 
Uh, I think this dictionary is helpful. Uh, it's Dictionary of Theological Terms by Alan Cairns. It's Reformed. Uh, and I can share more information with you later, but let's keep moving. The Father and the Son glorify one another. Turn to John chapter 5. Verse 41. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If, any, if another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. And he goes on. That word honor in the ESV gets translated glory. It's doxa. And that's one of the, the usages and meanings of that word doxa is honor. And he, you could word it that way. I do, not glor- I do not receive glory from men or honor here. So that's a, a use of that word can mean honor. But one of the things that we can learn here is that the Son and the Father have inter, uh, interaction in glorifying one another. Uh, Jesus says, I have come in my Father's name. So what Jesus was doing was not self-willed or independent of the Father. It was in uh, subjection to the covenant of redemption voluntarily, a commitment. And he has come in his Father's name. To come in the Father's name is to glorify the Father insofar as he reveals him, which being the Son of God in the bosom of God, he does that perfectly. And he's rebuking these Jews because he says if, if another person comes seeking their own glory, you're going to receive him. But the moment somebody comes uh, seeking to glorify God, you reject it. And that's exactly what I'm doing. You're rejecting me because you reject God. In John 7, 16... Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he, that's Jesus here, he's referencing himself in the third person. But he who seeks the glory of the one, that's the Father, who sent him, that's Jesus, is true. Jesus seeks the glory of the Father who sent Jesus. And what you can see here is that what the goal of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was perfectly fulfilled and obtained, was to glorify the Father. He sought to do the will of the Father. So everything he's saying is the words of the Father. Everything he's doing is what the Father has willed him to do. Um, And what you can see here is that in our understanding of glory, the glory of God, we we can focus on the substance of the divine essence and talk about various attributes of God but as our theology of God grows and we continue continue to study the glory of God we must maintain a trinitarian theology of God's glory we must see that God's glory is manifested in the father and the son and the holy spirit and how they are relating to one another It's the basis for many of the things that we don't realize. The the one and the many. Uh, Salvation. Uh, Communion. So to grow in our theology of the glory of God, we must continue to advance upon what's revealed of God and, and his Trinitarian 
name. And what you can see here is that the son seeks to glorify the father. No one can accuse Jesus of acting out. You're a self-proclaimed Messiah. He, he, he's very clear. You will not get that. And the father's attesting to his sending of the son through these signs later. Go to John 17, and then we'll move to the next point. Jesus, I'm reading from verse 1. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Pay attention to that. The hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. What you can see here is that uh, the Father and the Son glorify one another. Uh, they in and of themselves, uh, not that there are three gods, there is one God, but the per second person of the Trinity being fully God s seeks and does so outwardly towards the Father and it's internal with the Trinity, so I don't want to get carried too far outwardly there. But it seeks to glorify the Father. To uh, delight in the Father. We have a question. This is our question from Miss Pamela. She said, we desire to glorify God in all we do, but in times where we fail in doing this, is this rejecting God? Uh, yes, I mean, when, when I hear you say the word fail, I think of sin. You might not mean that, but if I take that to mean we sin, that is a form of disobedience and rejection of God. Um, our standing with God and our security isn't based on that sin, it's based on the works of Jesus Christ. So we know as adopted children in union with Christ that although we have sinned and by God's grace with the Holy Spirit convicting us of that sin are ashamed and sense the rejection in our conscience that we have set forth towards God, at simultaneously in the recognition and repentance from that, we know that God is not far, that he is our father and he has uh, redeemed us by the blood of the lamb and we have died to sin so that it will not have reign over us and we have been raised to newness of life. And uh, if you don't fight sin from that position, you won't have, you will not overcome sin. We must overcome sin not from putting ourselves back up underneath a works-based sanctification. But we must put ourselves in a justified state of grace. Recognize that with remaining sin we have disobeyed God. And that he is set his son, our intercessor, our high priest on his throne. That we might be able to come in time for help and for grace to help us overcome that sin. So what the Christian does instead of running from God when they see their sin is they see their sin and they fly to God. Yeah. But uh, to be sensitive about sin and grieved over it is a good thing. So it, me saying that is not intended to throw a wet blanket on the, the evil 
the, the sinfulness of sin. And, and actually, the more you put those two, two together, sin is exceedingly sinful, seen in the glory, in the face of the glory of God and in his word with a renewed mind and then in, in the context of the cross, it's exceedingly sinful, right? And yet, God has saved me. God has called me with an effectual calling and given me the guarantee of the Holy Spirit and is fulfilling the promise of his salvation by Christ. And when you put those things together and you don't throw one out, but you keep them together and you deal with this one in light of this one, uh, you have power by God's grace to overcome this. And this only heightens your love of God and your fear of him as you see it and turn from it. Uh, so let's go now. I just wanted you to see from John chapter 17 that the son is praying and the hour has come and he's saying, Father, glorify me for this purpose that I also may glorify you. And, and the father glorifying the son and making manifest the, 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 the glory of his son, the son in turn will take that and return it back to the father. So you can see this inter-Trinitarian glorifying father to son, son to father. That should help us in our theology of the doctrine of God and, and the glory of God is that um, we need to be careful not to have a theology that's man-centered but God-centered. Christ came and he saves and he loves us. The Father sent the Son and his love for us is beyond comprehension. However, the Son is seeking to obtain that purpose to fulfill a greater purpose and that is to glorify the Father. So, we want Christ to want to glorify the Father and it ought to bring us comfort to know that he does. And vice versa, the Father to the Son because of God's revealed will and his promises and covenant. All right, let's go to God's glory revealed in signs. I'm not gonna go to every one of these signs and... Sure. Yeah, Pastor Michael has a, uh, a text that he's going to share. Thank you. Um, just with, and when you were talking about uh, the Trinitarian aspect of the glory of God and how um, the Father glorifies the Son in order that the, the son might glorify the father. And I was just thinking about um, John chapter 16. It's just the chapter before mm -hmm. um, when the Lord Jesus is comforting the disciples after he tells them that he's going to be leaving them um, but, uh, and their hearts are going to be heavy, that they are going to be um, sad. He says in, in verse um, 12, you know, I, I, I still have many things, so John sixteen twelve. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his authority, but whatever, whatever he hears, he will speak. You know, it's like almost exactly what the Jesus son said. was saying about the father. Yeah, yeah, what Jesus was saying of himself, you know, that the, the son does not speak on yeah. his own authority. But what the Father gives the Son, the Son speaks uh, earlier in John. Um, so he, for, and now he's speaking of the Spirit. Um, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And so you have, you know, the Father <laughs> glorifying the Son, that the Son might glorify the Father. The Father and the Son 
sending the Spirit so that the Spirit might glorify the Son, that the yeah. Son might glorify the Father. Amen. That's very helpful to, to continue with that. Thank you very much, Pastor Michael. Um, it says that he will take what, it, why will he glorify me? Or, you know, he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. It reminds me of how no one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. It's, uh, there's that glorifying of the Father in the sense of declaring him, exegeting him, making him known. And that's exactly what the Spirit is doing here is glorifying the Son and making him known. And that's what we want to do is we want to receive what has been revealed that we might know them. Know, the, know our God, our triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. Amen. And that's a good application. Uh, and we could go into later, even here, but also because Jesus says he breathed on them in John. And he says, receive the Spirit and forgive sins. And that's alluding to later the church and be, having the doctrine of the keys and, and uh, having... Uh, authority given to them by Christ to go and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, so an application is in our New Testament era uh, is let us glorify God the Father, Son, and Spirit by declaring what we know of them from the scriptures. Amen. That's a great application. All right, let's go to God's glory revealed in signs. And <clears throat> I'm just going to read them and then stop at two and go to the purpose. If you will remember in John chapter two, actually, I'm going to, I want to look at that one because it's the first one and John makes it so clear. Let's go to that one. We're not going to read all, all the texts. Uh, there were six water pots in verse six. Verse 12, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples. Keep going. Did I miss it? I skipped it. Oh, yeah, verse 7. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast and they took it when the master of the feast had tasted the water and that was made wine and did not know where it came from but the servants who had drawn the water knew the master of the feast called the bridegroom and he said every man at the beginning sets out the good wine but the guests have well drunk when the guests have well drunk and then in the inferior you have kept the good wine until now this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. You could see the, the appropriate outworking or effect of Jesus manifesting his glory is that the elect believe. Uh, so here we can see a, a relationship between the work of turning water into wine and it being a means by which we come to better understand the glory of God. So that's why they're called, that's why John calls them signs. A, a sign is not something that points to itself. It's something that points to something else. And the sign is pointing to the glory of the Son for the purpose that you might know who you put your trust in. And as you look at the signs, if you study these on your own with this lesson later in the week or with your kids, you want to continue to remember that's why John is putting these things in here. It's not just to be wowed by the supernatural. That's true. We ought to be awestruck. That's why they're called wonders. Um, however, there's a purpose. And we need to remember that purpose from John. John puts it here in the front and he puts it there on the end. These, that 
quotation I read to you in the beginning, that we might have life in his name. So we need to, as we're thinking about the glory of God in the work and the sign, we need to think about what it's teaching us of God and his sufficiency to save us. Uh, Robinson. Got a question from Sister Nikki from John 17. I have two questions. Do you want me to ask them at the end or kind of ask? No, no, this is good. I like it like this. Okay. All right. Uh, John 17 verse 22 says, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them. And I think in her version, it says shared that they may have, that they may be one just as we are one. So the question is how, can you explain how John 17, 22 relates what glory is shared with us? Okay, uh, well, not using particularly that text, I can interpret that text because of the analogy of Scripture and the analogy of faith. And when I say the analogy of Scripture, it's like comparing Scripture with other Scriptures that speak to the same thing. But the analogy of faith is Scripture gives us clear revelation dealing with uh, topics. It's not organized that way, but we can, in our finite minds, study justification by faith and go to the Bible, see how Paul brings it out in Romans and Galatians, and get a thoroughgoing, very clear, infallible understanding of justification by faith from Scripture. Of course, it won't be comprehensive, but it will be infallible for what is rightly interpreted. Well, with that doctrine, we can use that doctrine that's clear to help us interpret Scripture. That's the analogy of faith. So yes, there's Scripture compared with Scripture, but there's also analogy of faith. When something says to me, that looks like salvation by works, well, I, I know it's not because the Bible's so clear on salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone. And I don't want to get carried away. You can get carried away with the analogy of faith and take vague things and make that your basis and standard and then have a worked interpretation of other things. But that's why I say clear. Well, one of the things is ontologically the being of God. He is incomprehensible and unique, infinite, un- other, holy, separate, categorically different. We are not in the same category as God. So when we're talking about God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, we're going to use a whole lot of creation words to help us better understand that. But we're, we're seeking to take what God has communicated through those those means that we can understand to understand the invisible who we're we're visible and why am I I bringing that out because when we're talking about glory of God and glory of the Son and glory of the Spirit we know that um, my glory I will not give to another so in one sense the Bible shows that this glory that God has is intrinsic to himself and uh, cannot be shared with any. And yet there is another aspect to God's glory when he outwardly declares and extrinsically, that means outwardly, manifests it to others in saving, in turning water into wine, in giving us new life in, in the spirit, in justifying us, that God's glory is outworking to bring about these effects and of course it reciprocates back to him in praise but that effect that is occurring in believers where they are brought into uh, union with Christ does not make them divine or share in divinity so when it says that the glory there it's I know from ontologically what the Bible teaches about God and about man that there is the 
intrinsic glory of God which he possesses and is that cannot be communicated to man who's finite. It's entirely his and only his. And that goes along with Isaiah 42, I think, uh, where he says, my glory I will not give to another. Uh, but there is another sense in where God uh, causes us to commune with him and he uh, gives us a new heart and causes us to do his will by the spirit and puts us into vital spiritual union with his son. And when he does that, we are partaking in some sense of this outward working of God's glory. I hope that helps. Okay. And there's another one. From Miss Betty, uh, when Christ took on the form of man, he condescended and took the form of man. So Miss Betty wanted to know prior to his incarnation, what form uh, did Jesus have he's, prior he's, to becoming man? He's in? invisible. He's all those things that we use to describe God, he is. Uh, he is righteous. Perfectly and infinitely. Uh, she's saying before the incarnation, right? Yeah. What form? Yeah. Oh, yeah. John four, he got his spirit, but that's not even like a angel spirit or our spirit. This is talking about God, who is immense and omnipresent. So, when our even our understandings of spirit can be wrongly thought of when we think of God. It's not like he's a massive fog and takes, takes uh, some kind of foggish form. It, that's not it. He's invisible. There's no form physical to him. So when I hear the word form, I think physical and that's already a wrong way to go about trying to understand Jesus uh, or the Son of God before the Incarnation. He is, uh, I wish we had that quote from Charnock. <laughs> um, where, yeah, Stephen Charnock, where he's, he's, he is this and he's not that. He is this and he's not that. We're saying this and yet without that. It's, it, uh, I know that I'm not doing justice by quoting it, but the point is, is that uh, physically, and, and dealing with the material of creation and space. Space gets its existence because God created. Well, before creation, there was no space. There was no one inch. It, 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 it takes meaning with the creation. So before the incarnation and before creation, the Son of God is um, omnipresent. He knows no bounds he knows no present place. Like he, he knows no limits. So it's, it's hard to, to describe him as a form, being God, a very God. Hope that helps. Um, let's go to Lazarus, uh, John 11. I want to get to the third point. We're almost out of time. John 11 and this is where Jesus resurrects Lazarus. And if you will remember, they asked, uh, uh, let's go to verse 40, uh, verse 39. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha said, Martha, the sister of him who was dead, that was Lazarus said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. 
And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to him, loose him and let him go. That was a manifestation of the glory of God. Their understanding of God had to fundamentally grow and change there. They had to say, uh, she was saying, there's a stench, Martha. What would she say afterwards? If Jesus says, I'm going to resurrect and my, who, whoever I choose and in the end day there will be a resurrection, Martha would have a better understanding through that sign of the power of God, of the glory of God. So when God says he makes that which is nothing something and he calls that which is dead to life, that sign should tell you, spiritually speaking, with a dead sinner like me, an unrighteous, ungodly man who has no hope uh, apart from God, when he comes and God alone comes and calls me, I'm going to come out like Lazarus. It's, it's no one will hinder God in whatsoever and nothing, not even death will, will hinder him or even so much as slow him down. Alive. God doesn't even have to work to do that. He just commands it. He just wills it. He doesn't even have to do anything. That, that, that sign should teach us about the power of God and his glory and this is a healing. We know that the death he, he has experienced is a part, a part of the curse. It's a grace that he's been resurrected. It's going to show that God is going to create a new heavens and a new earth. He's going to call all those that were dead that he's chosen to life. So we need to trust his Messiah. We need to trust the sign who is pointing to him to save us, to save us from sin today. Um, it's, it's sad but we wallow in sin at times as if there were no body to save us and we recognize our inability to overcome that which seems to have such great power and it's almost like the grave itself and Jesus is saying here don't be like Martha you know, uh, didn't I say if you would believe, you'll see the glory of God? If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will grant you strength. He will cause you to overcome that sin and you will bring out new heart motives, new forms of righteousness in ways that you haven't ever lived. So uh, those are the signs. And that's the John, I'll just read it again at the top there. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, you may have life in his name. Let's go to the last point. God's glory revealed in the cross. In John, Jesus frequently is cited saying that his hour had not yet come. My hour had not yet come. What was the hour? And in John 7, he says it, John 12, and other places. John 2, John 7, 30, John 8, 20. There's this anticipation of the hour of Jesus being glorified. Yes, he was glorified by the Father in his words and in his works, the signs. But there's this particular hour that's coming where the Son of Man will be glorified. And what that's referencing isn't just the resurrection or the exaltation of Christ where he is resurrected then ascends. It includes the cross. And I want you to see that. So go to John 12. Oh, man. <laughs> There's... The uh, as I was meditating on this and trying to better understand why the cross 
being that it was the shame which he endured, the suffering, the imputation of sin and guilt, the Gethsemane prayers and him saying, if, you know, let this cup pass for me. Um, why is it the, the time of his glory? Why is it, why do we include this in his, the hour has come for the son to be glorified? Um, and it has to do with a number of things, but particularly what's occurring at the cross, what the Messiah is doing in the name of the Father uh, to fulfill salvation. Um, and let's look at that, though. John 12, verse 20. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to the worship at, fe at the feast, and Philip came. then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. These are Greeks. These are Gentiles. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But, he, but Jesus answered them, saying, Remember, prior to this, the hour has not come. Hour has not come. This event of the Greeks coming seeking Christ, the Gentiles, was for Jesus the clear indication that the hour had come. He says, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And look at what he says. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant all, will also be. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. My, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. He's talking about the cross. He knows that from this point forward, he is setting his face to go to Jerusalem and there, there it will terminate in his death. And that's why he uses the grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies. And then he goes into if anyone does not hate his life. So what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. He knows that it's not a time of, it's a time of suffering. But then he, he's saying, no, this is the purpose for why I came. Well, the grain, when, when you take a seed in an, uh, an agricultural society knows this very well, but when you take a seed, if I just set it right here, it's not gonna do anything. If I want a bunch of apples off this apple seed in a tree that bears apples, and I leave it right here, it's not gonna grow any apples. But what I have to do is put it in the ground and then with proper fertilization and water, that seed will actually cease to exist in the way that it was. It will die, so to speak. But what will come forth from it is a tree. And off that tree will bear all these apples. And that's what Jesus is saying is, um, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. It's in the death that the grain comes out. And what that's a figure of speech pointing to is it's in the substitutionary, sin-bearing death of Jesus Christ for his people that their sins are atoned for and that they have the foundation for their new life. And then all these people who in history were justified and all those to come that will be justified, all on the basis of this death, this life and this death, found in this person, the Son of God. And he's saying, I, got, I must die. I must die. And immediately he's thinking about those that, will, that he came to die for. You will imitate me. And that's why he goes into the discipleship. You know, Peter uses that uh, um, he was despised and rejected and he, was, he suffered, leaving us an example. 
that we too might. So the Christian life is one of a form of suffering. And it, it has particularly to do with your own agenda and self-willed lifestyle, your own idolatrous, self-glorifying direction in life must die. Some, we look at a grain of wheat dying so it brings forth life and we look at Christ dying and atoning for sin that it brings forth life and salvation and justification for people and ev- everything. And so the life of a believer, he must hate his life and die to that that he might bring forth fruit unto God. That's the whole thing where he who loves his life will lose it And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. You can see there he's talking about the the temporal and eternal, temporal and eternal. He loves his life temporally. You you want to keep your life. Let's say I want to keep keep my life in this world. I want to do what I want to do. I want to live until a ripe old age and die the way I want to die. Well, you're going to lose it in eternal life. But if you want to have eternal life, lose your life. It's not meritorious. It's not speaking of works-based salvation. It's talking about the necessity that is enabled by Christ and will occur in the life of a believer as proof of their salvation. It's still a necessity. So having said that, let's go to John 19, and I think we're really close. The hour has come. Uh, Also, Judas is going to, Judas is going to take uh, and leave from the Lord's Supper and the the son will say that his time has come again, that the hour of the son has come. And in John 19, after this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, this is, we don't, I I put in here entire account, uh, 18.1 18.1 through 19.42. So we could go through two chapters to look at the account that John gives of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And I'm only hitting on this one place. And I think from here you will better see that this is in conjunction with the resurrection, glorifying God, glorifying the Son. It's the hour of His glory. Knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scriptures might be fulfilled, said, I thirst... Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when he had received the sour wine, he said, Tetelestai, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. That word of it is finished is full of truth and um, very glorious Um, if you remember Colossians uh, Colossians 2 14 and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with, and with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. And that's another thing he said in another place. It's talking about how the, the, that the, uh, the Satan would be judged at the time of his crucifixion. It's because of what Christ is accomplishing, um, having disarmed principalities and powers. They're disarmed. The weapons of their warfare are produced as worthless now. They have no way to bring men into their condemnation for their sin when the Christ has atoned for it. He's taken the sin that they... Uh, labor to put to put them under heavy judgment and greater forms of condemnation and he has nailed it to the cross so when he's on the cross he's a worker he's the high priest he's not just the lamb so he's offering up himself to God 
And when the priest was dressed up in all his garb, he was glorious in the midst of offering on the day of atonement his sacrifice. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing. He has prepared the lamb. He is the lamb. And he is offering it. And he knows, he's, he's not like clueless or he knows exactly why he's suffering. He knows he's atoning for the sins of his people. And his spirit, you think about like the suffering that we can't even comprehend that he endured. Hell upon hells. And what's his spirit like it's one of humility it's one of desiring that God be glorified and that his will be done in saving them it's not reluctant and he said when I am lifted up I'll draw all men to myself um, and that's exactly what he's done so uh, the, I'm sorry that I'm getting emotional and that it might distract you. But it's hard when you begin to meditate on it and God giving you underst some understanding of the, that glory there. It's, it's very precious. And I hope that you will, it will not elude you. Um, but that you will grow in, in your understanding of not just seeing Christ as glorified and his uh, humanity being resurrected. Yes, and we, we didn't even get to go there. But in John 20, he manifests himself to, to Thomas and Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And he says, blessed are you. But also in the work of Christ as, as the sin bearing atonement. When he uses the title son of man, he m predominantly almost all the time is thinking not just humanity and it's, it's uh, more than that it's suffering sin bearing suffering um, and I, I don't I have that down here I was going to read it but we'll stop there so uh, please know that God's glory is revealed in Christ on the cross as well as the resurrection, ascension, and session. Um, and it's because what Christ is accomplishing on the cross when he says it is finished is he is suffering unto death for his people. He's giving the basis for which they will be forgiven. And that work that he's accomplishing in the midst of that infinite suffering is glorious. It's a perfect work. So um, there's much we could say about the love of God and then an application, but for time's sake, let's stop there. Uh, we did get some application in the midst of it, and plus I have some study questions for you to think over. Gracious Father in heaven, uh, we praise you for revealing so clearly and uh, thoroughly your glory and the glory of the Son and of the Spirit. We praise you for the life of our Messiah, your Son. We praise you for his finished work and his glory and resurrection. And we look forward to partaking of uh, the new heavens, the new earth, glorification, because, Lord, we will be with you. We will be with you in a way that although we have in some sense now will be fulfilled and consummated in that day. And we pray that you would come, Lord Jesus, and uh, that all your enemies will be made your, your footstool and that you would finish that which has been accomplished in the application of our salvation. Thank you for this church, and I pray that we would grow as the study continues and that our worship this morning would be in faith, acceptable in your sight. Amen.